Hi folks and welcome back to school. Um, Happy New Year. I uh, hope you had a, a lovely Christmas. Um, we're back to this um, online learning, aren't we? So let's give it a good shot. Um, we're going to start with, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a halt to what we were doing before we broke up, which was we, we were revising for our coast assessment. Um, there's a bit of a stop to that though now, isn't there? Because we're not in school um, and it's not easy for me to set you a test like that now online. So I'm going to just move on to our new topic. Um, we're going to look today at the causes of urbanisation. Just to let you know, urbanisation means the growing percentage of people living in towns and cities. So living in urban areas, it's a growing percentage of people compared to the people that live in the countryside. Now, please remember, um, you can hear me, but I can't hear you, obviously. So if you have questions um, in today's lesson, then you need to go back onto Teams and write your questions in the question and answer box and I will try and help you. OK, nobody else can see your questions either. It's all anonymous. So please don't um, struggle. OK. Um, how is the world's urban population changing? So remember, urban people living in urban areas, so towns and cities. There's a few questions there that I'd like you to have a go at. So I want you to pause this slide after three seconds, have a go at those questions and then pause to hear the answers. Three, two, one, pause. OK, so question one, what does rural mean? Rural means people living in countryside areas where there isn't much um, development like roads, um, infrastructure, services, um, jobs. It's mostly countryside, it's mostly Greenland. Question two, what's happening to the proportion of people living in urban areas? Um, looking at the graph there, the urban areas is shown with green. And as you can see, in 1950, uh, people living in urban areas was about 30 percent. And over time, it has shot right up. We're now in the year 2021 and it would be roughly, probably roughly just over 50 percent looking at that graph. Um, so it's gone up. Question three, when did more than half of the world's population live in cities? Well, the halfway point was 2010, shown by the red line. That was when the percentage of people living in rural areas had fallen all the way down and from 70 to 50. And um, the percentage of urban had increased from 30 percent again to 50. That's where they crossed over. So that point there, 2010, is your answer. And the final question, what is expected to happen in the future? Well, in the future, we're expecting the percentage of people living in rural areas to decline all the way down to around about 30 percent by the year 2050. And we're expecting the percentage of people living in urban areas to go up to about 70 percent. So we will have seen a total reversal in the pattern. OK, so at this moment in time, just over 50 percent of the world live in towns and cities and the other 50 percent or just under still live in the countryside. Very, very different to wealthy countries like ours. In wealthy countries like ours, between 80 and 90 percent of people live in urban areas. They're not living in the countryside anymore. Most of us tend to live in towns and cities, but that's not still the case for um, very poor countries. Let's move on. Um, this map here is showing you the percentage of the urban population in each country. So it's showing you um, the number of people as a percentage that live in towns and cities. Let's start with the UK. Um, in fact, I might be able to draw. So let's start with the UK. I'm going to circle it in blue, just in case you aren't aware. That's the UK. And if we look down here at this um, key, you can see that pretty much over 80% of us live in towns and cities. And that's true of the continent of North America, if we don't include Mexico. So we look at the USA here and Canada here. So very, very wealthy countries. Um, and it's true of Australia and New Zealand. Again, very, very wealthy countries. So our wealthy continents, North America uh, and Oceania, and us as part of Europe, if I just highlight all of Europe there, you can see our numbers are quite high on the key. I mean, there are some countries in, in Europe, I'm just marking them now, that are slightly less, at more like 40 to 40 to 50, 60 percent. But generally speaking, these wealthy continents here have got high levels of um, 
urban population. You might be thinking, OK, well, there are other areas in South America. Look, circling them now, we've got that country there is Brazil, for instance. And this country here uh, is Argentina. So we've got some other countries as well. So South America as a continent is um, has a pretty high percentage of urban population as well. And then when we start to look at the, top, the continents that have got less than 20 percent, what do you notice about where they all are? Well, let's circle a few places. These areas here, less than 20 percent. And just here. Which continent are they in? Africa. And if we look at between sort of 20 to 40 percent and 40 to 60 percent, we've got most of this continent. Most of Africa lies within there. There are a couple of exceptions, obviously. Um, Saudi Arabia, just here, is an exception, isn't it? But the majority, most of countries in Africa have got a very, very low percentage of urban population. You might have identified other areas on the map. Let's identify this area here. Then we've got a number of countries in Asia. Now, these are in the south of Asia. Uh, we've got India, Pakistan and the surrounding countries. So we've got a group of countries all clustered together there, look, that have got not very many people living in towns and cities. So most people are living in the countryside. OK, we're going to be going through some slides now and I want you to complete the tasks that are on the slides. So this one here, how is the world's urban population changing? You've got a question there to describe the trends shown in this graph for at least two of the continents shown. The names of the continents are written just here down the side. I know it's quite difficult to read some of those. I'll help you out. We've got Africa at the top, which is the green line, Asia, then Europe, South America, North America. And then we've got some, uh, we've got the UK, that's not a continent. The world is not a continent, Oceania is a continent so you could talk about that one and china is not a continent so really i want you to describe the trends of one of these or at least two of those sorry and you can use that one if you would like because those are our continents now in order to get four marks you've got to give the overall trend so is it going up is it going down is it going up quickly is it going up slowly does it start going up quickly and then balance out? I want you to actually give the overall trend. The way to get more marks is to then give numbers. So I'm asking you to describe the trends for two of those lines. So let's just say each of those lines is going to get you two marks. One, one mark for the overall trend and then another mark for using numbers from the graph. OK, then do the same for your other line. So choose your two continents, use dates and statistics, and I've given some starting sentences just here for anybody that is sat at home now thinking, I don't know how to start. OK, I've given you some starting sentences. Use those to help you out. Pause the slide now. I want you to spend at least five minutes on this because it's worth four marks and then you can move on. Three, two, one, pause. OK, now it'd be nice if you submitted your answer to that question to me. So if you could take a photo of your work or if you've done it, if you, if you want to type it up and send it me on an email or through Satchel One Learning, that's absolutely fine. If you send me work, I can not only mark it, but I can build an evidence base for you about how you're doing at your geography, which might become important when it comes to your exams. We don't know what the future holds for you and it can be uncertain. So it'd be nice to build up an evidence base of how well you're actually doing. So you could submit that to me, please. OK, our next slide. Why do cities grow? Now, again, I'd like you to describe the pattern of urban growth. Again, it's four marks. So I want you to spend five minutes on it. I want you to look here at the map. You might need to strain your eyes a bit because actually this map is showing you the world map. You might need to tilt your screen so that you can actually see the world. It's a little bit faint. But what you should instantly notice is that some areas of the world have got very high 
patterns of urban growth. This is the urban growth per hour. So, for instance, your eyes should automatically have gone over to the east. So you can call that area the east. It's, um, it's actually the southeast, isn't it? Southeast Asia. Places like Delhi have got 79 per hour of people being added to it. And Dhaka, 74 people per hour being added to the city of Dhaka. So you can see how rapidly it's growing. Um, there are other countries around there as well, like Mumbai, it's got 51 people being added. Shanghai, 53 people being added. So there's an awful lot of growth right here. And then we've got other areas. Now cast your eyes to the areas where the dots are very small and there's not much being added. Well, there's a couple of continents where there's barely any numbers shown. I'm hoping you're spotting them now. One would be the continent of North America around New York, so that would be the blue circles. Most of them are very, very small, showing that not many people are being added. Um, New York is the most, 18 people per hour. And the other area is the green area, so the area around Europe. So London, Berlin, London the most really, nine people per hour. So there we go. You can see the rate of change. OK, now, having just described those few areas to you, you could perhaps describe the pattern of urban growth. So start with the areas where there is most growth and name places and use numbers. So we've said Southeast Asia, haven't we? You can name a couple of those places and use the numbers. Um, I, guess, I guess you could give the second um, area that's got the largest pattern of growth as well would probably be the pink area, wouldn't it, in Africa on that western side. And then you can give patterns where there is very low levels of urban growth. So again, around Europe with the green dots and around North America with the blue dots. And again, you can submit your answer to me on this. There is a challenge question for anybody that's looking at getting a level seven, eight or nine. And that is to what extent is urbanisation linked to the level of development? What that means is, are these speeds of growth linked to wealth? Are wealthy areas growing rapidly or growing slowly? That's really the question. And are the areas that are growing rapidly, are they wealthy or poor? So is there a link? You can always answer that question and again, submit it to me on Satchel One Learning. OK. Why do cities grow? So answers to the questions. You could have up to two marks for the general pattern. So you might have said the largest increases are in Asia and Africa, which are LICs. Ignore the fact that it says LIDC and EDC. They're old expressions. We use the expression LIC these days. So you can say they are LICs. The other expression we use is NEEs for newly emerging economies. So you get a mark for saying that, that that's where the largest increases are. You get a mark for saying that the lowest increases are in HICs. Don't know why it says ACs there, ignore that. The lowest is in HICs for high income countries like Europe, which is the green dots, and North America, which is the blue dots. So two marks for actually for using actual figures to illustrate your point. Um, so if you covered two areas, there's no reason there why you shouldn't get four marks. So you can mark your own on that and you can sit, submit it to me, like I said, to check. OK, why do cities grow? Cities grow for these reasons. Rural to urban migration is the movement of people from the countryside to the cities. And the rate of rural to urban migration is affected by push and pull factors. Push factors are negative things about where you live. So that in this instance, it would be negative things about living in the countryside. So, for instance, look at the bullet points. If there are few services like um, education and healthcare, that will push people away from the area. If there are a lack of job opportunities, again, people have no source of income. They're likely to leave the area. If you're unhappy, it will push you away. If transport links are really poor, so it makes it difficult for you to get anywhere and go to places, again, it will push people away. Natural disasters like having a drought uh, where you get no rain and then your crops die and your animals die and you're going hungry. That pushes you away. Wars breaking out between tribes will push you away and having a general shortage of food 
will cause people to leave the area. So push factors are negative things. Pull factors are really good things. They're the positives about going to live in the cities in this instance. So having access to services, having job opportunities, having entertainment, which we often call the bright lights. We call it the bright light syndrome because a lot of people move to cities wanting the bright light, you know, the, the, the bright lights of the city and the uh, cinemas and the theatres. But in reality, they often don't get them because they can't afford them. We've got better transport links. We've got much better living conditions. We might have things like sanitation. So people have flushing toilets and they have electricity to their homes so that they can have light and they can have heat. And people hope for a better way of life. It might even be that they've joined family, so they now have family links in the city. So that's why people move from rural areas to the um, to urban areas, to the cities. And the rate is phenomenal in poor countries, like you saw on the graph before, places like India and Mumbai. They've got so many people being added to the city every hour as people go and search for better life. So why do cities grow? You will need to pause this YouTube video right now and you will need to go back to show my homework and click on the other YouTube link, which will show you a clip on India. And what I'd like you to do, please, is I would like you to write down the, um, the reasons why people leave um, Indian villages, please. So that's your question, the one in purple. What are the push factors in rural India? So listen out for them as you watch that clip. OK, so pull factors are things that attract people to move to the city, as we said. As you can see, we've got a table of information there. Um, so you can see some of the differences in urban areas. Rough income, that's people's earnings, is $540 compared to people that live in the rural areas, so the countryside at 320. So you can see there's a definite pull factor there to move to the cities for more money. Look at the number of doctors that go around 100,000 people. We've got 12 in urban areas compared to just four in rural areas. So you would have, um, you're more likely to get to see a doctor in the city and you'd have less of a waiting time, wouldn't you? There's got to be a pull factor there. Literacy, that's the percentage of adults that can read and write only half the adults that live in the countryside can read and write. Very low, 51%. Whereas if you live in the city, you're more likely to be able to read and write, which that suggests that education, you've got better access to education in the city. And finally, infant mortality means um, it's like the death rate of babies. So 21 out of 1,000 births are expected to die before their first birthday in rural areas. It's quite a high number, isn't it? compared to 17 in the city. Now, it's not that much less, but it is still lower. So you can see the differences in the areas and why that pulls people to the areas. So you've got a little question there. Use the data in the table to explain the pull factors for cities in India. OK, I don't want you to write up a massive answer. It's a short answer. I want you to use some of the data, please. At least two things to write up an answer to that question. Pause this and then move on when you're done. OK, finally, we have got um, population pyramid here. This population pyramid is a, is, a, is, a, is a pyramid showing the structure of a population for a low income country. The pink is the females, so the gendered colours, and the blue is the males. And it's got the age groups going up the middle and then you've got the percentage going on the x-axis and you can see the differences. You have got three questions and I'd like you to answer those questions please looking at the population pyramid. Pause this slide and then we'll go through the answers in just a moment. Okay answers. Which age group moved to the cities? Well it looks like people in the 20 to 20 up to about 25 to 29. The two age groups on the look at the blue side, the males, the two longest bars are the 20 to 24 and the 25 to 29 age group. So that would suggest that that age group is the age group that's moving to the cities. Why? Well, I suppose people in the age group between 20 and 30 
they're looking for jobs, they're looking for work, and they're probably having children, so they've got mouths to feed, so they need employment. At that age, between 20 and 30, they've finished school now, and they're looking to get jobs. So that will be why they're growing in that age bracket. Question two, how does this affect birth rates? Well, if we've got loads of people living in the city that are aged between 20 and 30, they are at the perfect age group for meeting a boyfriend or a girlfriend and settling down and having children. So if they have children, it's going to increase the birth rate. And you can see that already happening. You look right down at the bottom of the population pyramid. We've got quite a wide bar for the 0 to 4 age category on both sides. And that's because the people in that middle age group between 20 and 30 are having children. We call that natural increase because we are increasing the population naturally through having babies rather than um, through, through migration. And question three, there is better healthcare in cities compared to rural areas. How does this affect internal growth? Well, if there's better healthcare in the cities, people will move to the cities for that healthcare. So obviously the cities will grow. That's what we mean by internal growth, because it's all within the same country. The people living in rural areas are in the same country as the people living in cities. So that's what internal growth means. They're not moving between countries, they're moving within a country. Hence, it's internal growth. OK, so it would encourage the urban areas to grow. OK, let's move on. Finally, I want to finish on this slide, please. You can um, answer these two questions and then you can submit them to me, please, on Satchel One Learning. So pause this slide here. This should take you eight minutes. Can you please finish for homework if you don't get it finished in today's lesson? And um, like I say, submit it to me, please, on Show My Homework. Thank you very much, guys. I hope you've enjoyed the lesson and I'll see you again soon.